Welcome to the podcast. I am Shane Barker, your host of Shane Barker's Marketing Madness Podcast. My guest today, Michael Brenner, is going to talk about content marketing. He's the CEO and founder of the Marketing Insider Group, a company that helps businesses with their content marketing strategy. He's also an internationally recognized keynote speaker who speaks about leadership, culture, and marketing. Michael's also the author of two books, The Content Formula and Mean People Suck. Listen as he talks about the importance of storytelling and some of the things marketers get wrong with content marketing. Listen as he talks about the importance of storytelling and some of the things marketers get wrong in content marketing. All right, you guys, once again, hey, got another great episode here of Shane Barker's Marketing Madness podcast. We have Michael on the line. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time today, man. Thanks for having me. How are you? Absolutely. Doing good, man. Doing good. I say good and, and I am doing good, but you know, we've got this whole thing. Of course, by this session comes out, it's kind of crazy because you talk anything about the coronavirus that we've got going on. If this comes out in one week, there's like a thousand things that could change. So what we yeah. talk about today might not even be applicable. So, you know, we'll probably touch on that a little bit, but really the, the whole premise of the podcast is really to get know more about you and your organizations, things you got going on. A lot of our listeners obviously know who you are. We do send out polls and stuff and ask people, hey, like, who do you want to, who do you want us to interview? And you were one of the ones that came up. So we're nice. excited to have you on. Um, you know, for the people that don't know about you, I figure we'll do a little background story and kind of like where you grew up and all the fun stuff. Yeah. Why don't we start there? Why don't we just start off? Like, where did you grow up? Like, where do you, where you currently live now? Where did you grow up? Let's get a little backstory. Yeah, it sounds good. So I live in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 miles southwest of Philadelphia. It's kind of a halfway point. So I grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is about 50 miles directly west of Philadelphia. My wife grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, which is about 30 miles directly south of Philadelphia. So where we live now is kind of a central point. My brother and sister-in-law ended up going to the university in town. So they live close by. My mom ended up moving close by. So yeah, we're sort of well, we didn't grow up here. We all sort of congregated around this area. So it's nice. That is awesome. Yeah, it's probably nice for Christmas and everything else. It's kind of yeah. weird how people, individuals end up there and then all of a sudden the whole family kind of ended up there. So I guess yeah. that's some good stuff going on there. So how big was your family growing up? So I'm one of four. I'm the third of three sons and then I have a younger sister as well. So a lot of fun, our household growing up. I was going to, your sister's probably heavily protected. <laughs> yeah, I can exactly. imagine with three older brothers, it was probably no, but even now probably the current husband is probably a little nervous at times just because there's, <laughs> you got three elders there just in case anything goes wrong. Not that we're saying anything would go wrong, but you know, just it's, yep. that protection is there. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. So what was anything interesting growing up? I mean, is there any fun facts? We have people, you know, we had one of my guests in the past said that she was a, a stripper, illegal stripper at the age of 16. So I don't know. I'm not saying you were a stripper, that you should be a stripper or that you shouldn't be a stripper. I'm not here to judge either way. But do you have anything interesting facts growing up? Anything fun in your family? I was a little different. It doesn't have to be stripper related, obviously. But Well, yeah. I mean, I do aspire to be a stripper at some point. So that's that's kind of a life goal. I, that's why I kind of alluded to it because I've obviously yeah. read you know some of your yeah. books. And at the end, you're like, I'm really hoping one day that my name can be <laughs> Ecstasy and that I can work the polls the way my family members have for the last few generations. So exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anything other than the, the stripper, which we all have that, obviously, that motivation to be one one yeah. day. But anything else? I'm trying to think. So uh, with the town I grew up in, Reading... Pennsylvania was sort of like, it was a major center of industry back in the late 1800s. And so the Reading Railroad was actually one of the more profitable ones in the country. And so the Reading Railroad is actually on Monopoly. So if you've ever played Monopoly, you know that you know about the Reading Railroad. Ah, Railroads. yeah. More recently though, it's become famous for some other things. So it was once called America's Pretzel City because uh, many of the major pretzel manufacturers started or at some point originated in the city of Reading. It was also the outlet capital of the world at one point until the gangs invaded the city a couple of decades ago, shot somebody in, in the head. So that kind of killed the outlet industry in Reading, Pennsylvania. And now its claim to fame is the largest murder rate per capita. So things have gone from good to bad. Now starting to turn around, there's a lot of economic development happening there. I'm rooting for the city. I haven't lived there in, gosh, 30 years, but still have a lot of friends and some family back there and still, you know, still rooting for it. But if you grow up in an industrial sort of city, I think any of us out there know, you know, the struggles yeah. that they're having. Ups and downs of the economy. Yeah, for sure. So murder rate in the cap, number one, the murder rate in the cap, which is exciting, which I will tell you once again, this podcast is coming out here in the next few weeks. We all are also here in the US are number one in coronas and coronavirus mm -hmm. rates. So that's, I mean, that's not really great, but I'm just saying that, you know, everybody's winning in separate categories. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about winning is the right term, but yeah, interesting. But things have obviously with Reading or we've got some things turning around there and you haven't been back there in a little bit, but still mm -hmm. obviously sounds like a great city though. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And then where did you go to college at? Would you, did you go to school? Talk, talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah. So I wanted to go to a small school in a big city. A couple of friends of mine who are a year older from my high school went to a, a small university in Philadelphia called St. Joe's 
St. Joseph's University, right on the border of the city and the suburbs, actually, right down the road from Villanova, which is a little bit more widely known school. Yeah. But it was a great school. It was, you know, a thousand kids, students per class. Pretty much everybody knew everybody. 50% from the local area, 50% from other places, but easy access to downtown Philadelphia, easy access to the beaches, which are about an hour and a half away. So yeah, it was, it was, I had a blast. Of all the people I know, I think I had a better college experience than they did. And so, you know, for the professors, the university and the friends that I made there. Sounds like a nice little hub city. I look at that. I live in Sacramento, California. And so I'm an hour and a half away from San Francisco and we're about an hour and a half away from any beach or mountain. And so I, I, that's what I enjoy about Sacramento is that we're a nice little hub city. It's like, you know, I can go jump into craziness of San Francisco and the tech scene or jump back into my safe cocoon, you know, here in Sacramento and, and be able to have nice the airports and be able to travel out wherever I need to travel. So yeah, that's cool. So what was your major? So I went in as an undeclared business major. So St. Joe's is a liberal arts school. So you go in undeclared, but you pick a mm-hmm. school. So I picked the business school undeclared. I took my first finance course and um, decided that I didn't want to be in the business school anymore. <laughs> Math was never a strong suit. So, so I actually took, I continued, I, I graduated with kind of an informal business minor. I, so I took all the credits I needed for a business minor minus finance, <laughs> but, uh, but graduated with an English literature degree, which I actually loved. And there was actually a study when I graduated by AT&T that showed that liberal arts majors actually perform in some cases and in some industries better in progressing up the management chain than business majors or MBAs. So, so it, you know, it, it served me well. I learned how to communicate, learned how to think critically, learned how to write a sentence, you know, which is always a helpful yeah. thing. And, and ultimately, and serve, you know, I think it served our speaking careers. It, uh, it taught me the fundamental components of a story. I think that's awesome. Well, especially these days, right? I think it's interesting when you talk about like that whole, that journey is because it's, it is like, you know, I, I had something kind of similar in my college was I kind of, you know, I want, I did more end graduating with my marketing degree, but I was looking at, I think the thing that pushed me away from finance was I did, I took an accounting class, like micro and macro in my finance class. And I thought, oh my God, like, the accounting thing, like I get the premise of it and, and everything is great and what's good. God bless my accountant that takes care of all of that stuff because we mm. would probably be bankrupt if I took care of it. But <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like, man, it's like, for me, it's like either you kind of get it and you're like, God, this makes sense. Or you look at it and you go, God, help us all. Like, I, you know, yeah. and then definitely need some help with this thing. And that was definitely for me, my marketing ended up becoming fully marketing was like, I was like, oh, I, I got the, like, my, for my, that's my mom's like, are you sure you don't want to do finance? And I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I can spell finance. It's just when we get into the other parts of it where like, you know, you really need to be good. I just yeah. don't know. So, and I think it's the same thing with coding. I've seen that. I took some, a few coding classes and I thought I'm going to get this coding thing down and not necessarily to do code, but just more to like, you know, with my team and be able to understand it. After the first semester, and this was outside of college, first semester, I was like, I'm, I should just pay them more. You know, yeah. like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, like the coding thing is just not even in my brain, like looks at it and just, and I realized that just because you stare at it doesn't mean you're going to understand it longer. Cause I did that yeah. too, as I just stared at it and was like, maybe if I blink or maybe if I go grab more coffee or something like that, maybe, and it just never helped and it never helped. It was one of those yeah. things. It's like, I, I got to, I'm going to stay in my lane and it helped as you did with you, right? It helped push you into like, okay, this is where I, I'm comfortable and I think with your background and with English, I mean, you got to be kidding me, right? Maybe at the time you're like, oh, this is great. But, you know, with what you're doing currently, obviously writing books and all the other mm-hmm. fun stuff, that's a huge, huge factor. I wish, honestly, I'm, I'm a writer and I, I'm going to use that term very loosely, but I wish that I would have spent more time working on my English, right? Working on that side of things because I'm not bad. And once again, shout out to my editors that edit things for me because mm-hmm. otherwise we would still be broke. If I didn't have an account, didn't have editors, we would go back to being broke again. That's right. It's <laughs> right. It comes back to that. It's like, you know, it's just being able to do that. I wish I was better at that. You know, and that was one mm-hmm. of the things I was telling my son growing up. It's like, hey, like with this, make sure you pay attention to this. It's not just about getting your B or your C or your A or whatever. Like really think about it because it's all foundational and you don't really realize that, you know, until you you get to the point you're like god i wish i would have listened in the eighth grade with you know mrs yeah. johnson was telling me to like do this and now i'm i get it and i can get pa- and get by but it's like is getting by enough so anyways right. yeah i think it's an interesting it's, i think most people when they were doing the english thing i thought well i think this could, you know i'll be do this or do that and i think it's especially these days with writing and what you do having content marketing i think is, is hugely beneficial so that's awesome that you know once again i think it's it's interesting i love to see people's their track and mm-hmm. where they end up right it's always kind yeah. of intriguing to me yeah, and, and I'm, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to sort of geeking out about just the components of effective stories. And, and if you can see my desk, I've got these index cards all over my, my, my desk here that have different formulas for, for telling a good story. 
it's pretty interesting. There's Joseph Campbell, there's the hero's journey, there's the Pixar way and a number of different ways that you can tell a story and, and formulas you can follow. But I just think it's really fascinating. And it, one of the things I'm thinking about for my next book, although it's totally saturated, but just the importance of storytelling, no matter what you do. I mean, if you think about the pandemic we're facing, the CDC, they need to learn how to tell a story that, that provides information in a way that emotionally grabs people. If you think about you know, CEOs, if you think about even CFOs, we all need to learn how to tell a story, whether we're running a business or running a finance department or you know, running a global health organization. All of those things need to rely on the ability to connect with people through stories. So you know, for me, it's kind of something I, I nerd out about. And, you know, if I can find a niche or an angle that's unique, uh, it may be my, my next book. I don't know. We'll see. No, that's awesome. That's kind of exciting. Yeah, I, I do think the storytelling, because that's the problem is it's everybody can just spit out information, right? I mean, you can go and educate or do this, and but it, it, it's that uniqueness and, and being able to put that story together, which makes it so that once again, it engages the audience. And I think that's mm-hmm. the hardest part, especially when you're, when you talk about like the CDC and who and all this, it's like, you know, they get the doctors up there, the scientists up there, and they're like, today this happened, da, 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 mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, cool, thank you. You're going to be like, wait yeah. a second. If you could be a little more, you don't have to be super entertaining. Like, you don't have to come yeah. out with like a clown hat on or anything. But mm-hmm. if you can, once again, figure out like, how can I get this to people, get them to listen to it, but make it more engaging so that people better understand what they have going on. I think that's the hardest part. Storytelling is a, is a science, right? It's hard. I mean, you're talking about different equations you have. Like, we have equations for writing. Like, whoever mm-hmm. would have really thought that, like, there's an equation behind something to be able to get more people to engage, but it, it does make sense. It makes total yep. sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Not easy, though. Not easy, no. right? I mean, it's one of those things. It's like, how are you able to get this to the masses and get people to yeah. what's going to engage or at least understand what's going on and better understand it and then, you know, hopefully share it with other people, especially in an environment yeah. like this, what we currently have going on. Yeah. And the myth I'd love to bust if I could is that a lot of people, and even I thought this at some point, wow, you know, these authors I remember reading in college, like, you know, I could never write like they do. I couldn't, I'm not a natural born storyteller. You can learn it. And that's one of the things I've learned is if you become a little bit of a superficial student of the art, you can start to see that there is a formula. There are techniques you can, anyone can apply. And I actually did a, I did a webinar for Harvard Business Review on the art of storytelling to for startup founders and small business owners because it's so important when they're trying to get funding and some of the formulas that are out there. And, and it's actually one of the most downloaded and watched HBR uh, webinars in the last two or three years. So I do think there's something there. Those are, you know, those are some of the, the signals I look to the universe to tell me, is this a topic I should double down on? So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I, it is. I mean, storytelling, you know, I think about, I've talked about this in past podcasts, storytelling is so important in the sense that I think of like, um, you know, wine as an example. Like when you have somebody sitting next to you and you're trying a glass of wine or a bottle of wine at a, at a, at a vineyard or a winery, and they're telling you the story of like how Giuseppe came over with one gold nickel and he had one seed that came from Italy from the region of blah, 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 blah. And then he started it here in Napa Valley and did this and did that. And him and his family worked there 37 hours a day out of 24. You're like, oh my God, poor Giuseppe. And it has this whole story behind it. Now you're trying the wine. You're like, oh my God, because at that point you're drinking a story, right? You have, there's like, oh my gosh, like the, the effort and the amount of things that went into this. And that's that story, right? People love that kind of stuff. Same thing with beers. Like when they want to talk about, oh, we're doing this, we add this, we add that, like the story behind it just brings, it brings things alive. Like I can guarantee you if you tried that same wine with nobody in your ear and somebody with you in your ear, like educating on you, your level of what you think of that wine or that beer is going to be up because once again, you're like, it brings out that passion. Like you're excited, you're engaged with that because of, you know, it's in the story behind it, which is, it's hard to do, but it's important. Yeah, exactly. So tell us a little bit. So out of college, what was your first job out of college? It's kind of funny. I was actually fired for my first job before I even started. You know, I thought I wanted to get into consulting and I graduated in 93. It was, we were coming out of a recession. I interviewed at a couple of the, you know, sort of big consulting companies and, and just didn't competing with the top smartest minds that are around the country for, you know, for a very few number of positions and just didn't make it. I ended up working for a market research company called Nielsen, which a lot of people have heard of. They had an account management role open in outside of Philadelphia, working on the Johnson and Johnson account. If I, I guess I'm allowed to say that, I think I am. And Johnson and Johnson fired the company that I was going to be working for that made my position a requirement. So I was called up on Thursday before I started and said, hey, sorry, your job isn't here anymore, but we do have an opening for a similar rollout in Chicago. So I was actually rehired the next week, but I had to move out to Chicago for a similar role supporting the Wrigley Gum Company. So Nielsen, if you know the TV ratings side of that, you know, they're sort of a measurement company. Nielsen also measures things that are sold in supermarkets. So they're very very busy right now. And so any manufacturer or retailer that sells anything that has a barcode on it, 
basically they track and measure those four P's of marketing, if you will. So yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I was selling to the world's greatest marketers using data about the four P's. That was essentially my first job. That's funny. So they're like, hey, by the way, we hired you for this job and you're fired, yes. but then we want you to move to a new city and you'll have a job over here, but I promise you it'll be secure. You're like, hmm, I got fired from my first job, which was local. I didn't have to go anywhere. Now you want me to travel somewhere and then you're going to promise me, pinky swear promise that my job mm -hmm. is going to be secure in Chicago. And then how long were you in Chicago for? So it's funny, I was there three years single, right out of school. I eventually worked my way into a marketing role that was based out of New York, and I was allowed to, to commute sort of two days a week from Philly. So this was back before remote working was really popular. It was kind of a battle, but I was able to move back to the area. I was here for two and a half years, I met my wife, got engaged, and the Thursday before my wedding, they asked me to move back to the sort of global headquarters in Chicago with my wife. So I spent three years in Chicago single and then three years there married, which was kind of interesting to experience. And Chicago is actually my favorite city in, in the world. It doesn't have the things you were talking about. It doesn't have access to the beaches, the mountains, the ski resorts. 60% of the, of the US population is, is within a two hour drive of Philadelphia. So there's a lot to see around here. But I love the city of Chicago and, and really had a great time there. I'll tell you, I'm a little bitter about Chicago. I'm, I've, I've got to bring this up. So it has nothing to do with the city. It has to do with, actually, it's really not anybody's fault. So I was supposed to be a keynote speaker at Oracle. They had their mm. thing in Chicago. It was going to be literally right now. Yeah. In fact, was it this week or last week? And my wife and I were supposed to fly out there. We had like, I mean, I was going to be out there six days and I was speaking for 20 minutes. So you do yeah. the math on what I really had planned on there. Like I, yeah. 20 minutes, get that done. And then we were going to be frolicking and having fun. And beautiful hotels and this. We had all lined up with restaurants and everything. And then obviously it got canceled. This was early on. This was a few weeks ago because of the coronavirus. And so I'm, yeah. I'm like, and at that time it wasn't quite as code red as it is now. And I was telling my wife, I was like, I think we should still go. Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah, but you're not, but it doesn't, why? But we don't, and this, I go, no, we, I think we should still go. I think we should go see mm -hmm. Chicago for six days. Yeah. And of course it wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked out because of the current yeah. situation. But yeah, man, I was, God, I was looking forward to it. I've only been to Chicago a handful of times and haven't had to spend a lot of time there. So I was, once again, a little bitter, once again, not against Chicago, still love all the people from Chicago. I am a little bitter at the coronavirus, but that's a whole nother conversation, another podcast. Okay, so you're in Chicago, you had the fun stuff with the wife and everything's good there. How did you start the uh, Marketing Insider Group? Like, how did that whole transition happen? Yeah, so, I mean, make a long story short. So I was with Nielsen nine years, really half of it in sales half of it in marketing. And then I went, we moved back here. Actually, I was able to, again, get the company to move me back to Philadelphia, working remotely. And at that point in time, I had a, a really good mentorship with the CMO, who was two layers above me. And he's like, listen, there's four people that report to me, or six, or whatever. And they're not going anywhere. And I'm not going anywhere. And the company's offering packages right now. We'd love you to stay because you're a great performer, but you've kind of hit the ceiling, if you will. I mean, I was only 28 years old, I guess. And he was like, hey, you know, I think you should take this package and go do something else. So I actually did. I took the package. I had six months severance, left on great terms, still friends with, with almost all the people I used to work with, worked at a couple of startups. And um, as I love to tell people, I learned how to do marketing without a budget. And it's funny, at the time, it was really marketing with content or what we now call content marketing. It wasn't, we didn't use that term or I didn't, I wasn't aware of that term at the time, but that's what I was doing. And, you know, took a couple of companies websites, traffic, leads, you know, implemented Salesforce and got marketing automation going at two different companies and, and really saw some great hockey stick results. From that success, I was then recruited to work as the first head of digital marketing at SAP. And we were really focusing on content-driven lead generation. The success of that program is, is basically all laid out in the book, The Content Formula. But because it was successful, they asked me to head up a global content marketing role that had never been, didn't exist before. So I sort of defined it and then they asked me to run it. So yeah, so I was there for seven and a half years, digital and then content marketing. I did some content marketing strategy consulting for a, a software startup for just over a year and learned sort of the process that I wanted to implement with clients out on my own. So in June of 2015, I started Marketing Insider Group, really focusing on developing content marketing strategies, all based on the past successes and the practical things that I learned working inside the corporate marketing departments and startups that I had worked with. And that's what we've been doing ever since. So it's a nice little mix because you grew up on the like almost unlimited budget, right? Like you have Wrigley and these other companies that not unlimited, but they're, you know, last time I checked, their pockets aren't touching. They've got some money to try some stuff. 
And then you went into the starving startup world where it's like, okay, our budget is, is nothing. So I want you to go ahead and make that work. And you're like, well, but Wrigley had 10 million for that campaign. Exactly. And we have, we have nothing. So, okay, mm-hmm. cool. Sounds good. That's not a problem. I love like just that range, right? Because it's very easy if you're all in corporate and there's just these big budgets, you think everybody has big budgets. And then on the other side, the startup is like, hey, we got to get, we got to pivot. We got to get frisky. We got to be able to do some different things. And those two, the dichotomy of that, of like these different ranges, I think I would, I mean, just as a marketer perspective, that's awesome. Like to be able to have that, that wider range and be able to understand both sides of that. Cause once again, it's very easy as a startup, you don't want to spend any money because you're worried about this, this, and this, and these guys just have plenty of money to spend. It's like being in the middle of that and understanding that I think is, it doesn't go wrong. So that's yeah. awesome. What's interesting to me is I, I see a lot of people, they focus on industry segments, their niche, they focus on B2B versus B2C. They focus on big budgets versus small budgets. They focus on, you know, large organizations and politics versus small. And what I found is that those things are not quite irrelevant, but what's common for every company is you want to find a way to grow in a way that delivers a return on investment. And you got to find a way to navigate through, let's say, the culture of your organization. And those two things I found to be the commonalities is, is a focus on results and an ability to build the confidence as a marketer to propose and defend why you want to do things that drive results. And so really the two books that I've written, The Content Formula and Mean People Suck, are trying to address those two things. Content Formula was all about here is the way to do marketing with content that delivers results guaranteed every time. The Mean People Suck was if you work for a company where you're not allowed to do marketing that works, here's a way to break through that impasse. Here's a way to break through the politics and really focus on customers because that's really the best way to deliver value for your companies. And yeah, so I kind of, my whole career has followed my frustrations, <laughs> if you will. And, and those are the ways that I've tried to give back in writing those two books. Which I think is awesome because it is, I mean, that's, you know, the value of not only books, but even the internet today is that a lot of people, not a lot of people, but a good amount of people write about that, right? And things of like that they've learned or haven't learned in the frustrations. And I think which is awesome because it, now we've got, I mean, you can go to somebody's blog and people that will talk about exactly what they've done to be successful. And that's what you're talking about in the content formula. Like literally here goes the formula that we use. And it's like, usually most people wouldn't talk about that, right? I mean, probably 15, 20 years ago, because it's like I, it's secret sauce, I can't tell anybody. But now there's so many resources, phenomenal resources where you can go and say, this is exactly how we did it. You can read somebody's blog and say, hey, this is what's successful for us. This wasn't successful for us. Yep. And what did we do and what do we need to change? I just, I love that. And it's, you know, we talk about this. I've talked about this in past podcasts about mentorship and reading books and education and stuff. It's like, it's one thing to get a, a university education. Great. That's awesome. But there's the other side of it as well is like, you can go read this book in whatever, 24 hours if you wanted and really up your game by 10, 20, 30%. I mean, yeah. it's like, that it doesn't get any better than that. So Tell us a little bit about the content formula. I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I, I really want to know it's a bestseller. I know you've had some phenomenal successes there. Kind of go into it a little bit more and kind of give everybody so, because I want people to get excited about it because really at the end of the day, they should go get the book. And that's what I want you to kind of set that premise for them. Thanks. No, I appreciate it. And, and you know, one of the things I'm, my publisher has been sort of sending me all these emails like, now's the time to push your book and people are home and they've got free time and you sell more <laughs> books. And I'm actually kind of doing the opposite. I'm not really pushing it. In fact, if, if your audience wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to send them a PDF of the book for free. But really, it covers how to build the business case for marketing from an ROI perspective as opposed to uh, because a senior executive asked us to do something. One of my most famous tweets or retweets when I speak is behind every bad marketing idea is an executive who asked for it. <laughs> and everybody laughs and a lot of people retweet that line. And, and I came up with that line because it's true. When I go around and I talk to senior marketers, like, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting money here? They always say, because this guy or this gal in marketing or, or product or sales or, you know, executive level teams have asked us to. So building the business case is the first step. The second is finding the budget, which is really the easiest part. Most people think it's the hardest part. It's the easiest part. The reason why is because every organization I've ever done an audit of has 50, 60, 70% of their marketing budget wasted towards activities that show no results. Granted, some of those things are things that are just hard to track. And, and I'm not going to say advertising doesn't work. I'd love to snidely say advertising is great for the people who have the budgets to spend on it. Can they measure the results? Not so well. I know when I was at SAP, we did a massive, very expensive multi-attribution modeling project with a really expensive consulting company and a data mining partner. And 
And they found that when SAP spent a certain level on advertising, it did increase the velocity of lead closure. It didn't identify leads, it didn't close the leads, but the velocity of lead closure increased when there was more awareness out in the marketplace. Granted, given that works, but the large majority, there's a huge ton of things that should be measured that can't show results. Lead generation programs, event marketing ideas, email campaigns. There's lots of stuff that marketers do that don't work that should be able to be measured. That's the easy way of finding the budget. And then the real bulk or meat of the book is measuring results, showing the ROI. And so in the book, I show or offer, demonstrate 10 formulas, calculations that anyone can use to measure the return on investment, whether you're trying to reach, engage, convert, or retain new customers for your business. And so it's laid out relatively logically. Like I said, it's all kind of, I use this, my SAP story. It's kind of the thread that ties all those things together. I also rely on a couple of other case studies, but largely talk about how we took a dollar and turned it into seven. And we did that because we built the business case by looking at the vast majority of marketing campaigns that delivered zero results that were all intended to show results. So we found some money that way. So we built the business case, we found the budget, and then we implemented a marketing program that delivered return on investment. I love it. You know, that's always the challenge, you know, ROI and anything, right? I do a lot of influencer marketing stuff. And I mean, I teach a class at UCLA and it's always, and it's the same thing is, is it always comes back to like, what do we look at? How do you figure out ROI, right? And especially with content marketing, because I, that's a, my team, I have a big size team, but we do a lot of content, right? Not only for myself, but other, some of our customers. Customers. And it is, ROI is one of the biggest things is like, how do you attribute these 10 articles that we've been, other than like SEO wise and great, they have their leads coming in and all that fun stuff. But like, how do you attribute that? Right? Because that's one of the first things to go like is content. It's like, well, I don't really know if it's working or not. Like when I do PPC, I know if I spend a dollar, I make $3 or whatever that may be. Right. They know that that's kind of what, what they've got going on. So we kind of look in that situation and go, okay, here it is. And this is what it is. And so I think being able to have you know, 10 different situations that you're able to, to show that I think is awesome because then it should be able, it sounds like you, you have just about everybody covered if anybody needs to read the book. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I'm happy to share the PDF of the book, the 10 formulas if you just want to get right to the, the heart of the matter. But it's been a lot of fun. It's actually been great lead gen for me as well. You know, and I now work with a lot of clients who read the book and said, hey, you know, can you come help us do this here? So it's, it's been a lot of fun. And one of the things that I did when I first started writing my first blog post back in 2009, this is actually May of 2009. And the first blog post was why I'm starting a blog. And basically, I just said, all I want to do, and at the time, I was in the digital function at SAP, leading the digital marketing efforts. And I said, you know what, I'm learning so much, and I'm learning what not to do in a lot of cases. I'm, I'm making a lot of mistakes, and I, I really just wanted to help people. And so that's been my main sort of trajectory has been amplified and accelerated only because I've been trying to help people. So anything I can do to help your audience and, you know, just being here to share these thoughts with you is, uh, is you know, really helping me to achieve that what? goal. And we appreciate that. It's your goal and my goal was the same when I started mm -hmm. my blog. It's the same thing was like, it was more about like, here, like this is things that are going good and these are things that are going bad. And I'm mm -hmm. just being honest with you, like, you know, yeah. and you either resonates with you or it doesn't, but like, hey, I mean, that's one of the benefits of, I think with what you do and with what I do today is like, we're able to, we're going to say, listen, we've spent a lot of money on this other stuff and we can tell you to the, you know, because of the research and things that have been done on what things that we think are going to be more successful, right? Because of the successes and the failures that we've had that get us to where we're at today. So I think that's, that's awesome. Once again, you guys, let me repeat this, that get a hold of Michael on LinkedIn and he's willing to send over the PDF of the book. That's absolutely phenomenal because most yeah. people would be looking to sell it right now and you're giving away for free, especially yeah. in a time when people are probably trying to figure out how are they going to retain or increase revenue, right? With mm -hmm. the, the current climate that we have. That's so right. phenomenal. Once again, we do appreciate that. Yeah. So what would you say, you know, we talk about content marketing and, you know, that's always an elusive subject for some, for some companies. How do you think most marketers get it wrong when it comes to content marketing? Do you have anything of like, Hey, these are the three things that I've seen, or is there anything? I mean, I'm sure you've probably, I know you've written about it, but is there anything that for you, you look at and go, okay, this is something that like they need to like improve upon? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things and you know, the biggest challenges that a lot of companies have, I'm still shocked actually in the industry, the marketing industry, I'm still shocked at how few people understand that content and content marketing are not the same thing. Or as I say in my keynotes, marketing with content is not the same thing as content marketing. And what I mean by that is an ebook is not content marketing. A podcast episode is not content marketing. A podcast series is content marketing. So, you know, you're, you're certainly doing it. A blog series of commitment to publishing every day, that's content marketing. On a platform you own, a YouTube video is not content marketing. You don't own YouTube. A Facebook post or a Facebook boost of a post or a Facebook ad is not content marketing. And so especially in, I find in the UK and in Europe, there's still a very, very huge campaign-based mentality 
of we pick a target, we define the message, and we blast it. And that's content marketing because we used content. It's not. So that's like I get, um, you could probably tell I'm getting worked up because I get so angry at the people that say, oh, content marketing, it's just another name for advertising or it's just another name for marketing. I hope it becomes another name for marketing, but it's, it's not. Most marketing is advertising driven and campaign based, and that's not content marketing. So what are some of the components of that? Number one, content marketing can be promotional, but only to the extent that it answers a customer question. So I always say it has to be customer question answer focused. And so, yes, customers do ask, what do you sell and how much does it cost? But you know, I love to use search terms, like the number of people that are searching, you know, the SAP example was the number of people searching for SAP's cloud computing product was one for every 100 or 300 people that were searching for what the heck is cloud computing. And for every one person who was looking for SAP's cloud computing product, there were 10 to 30 people who were searching for what the heck am I supposed to do with cloud computing? Why do I need it in my business? Then they were starting to ask, okay, well, who sells it? You know, who are the competitors? What are the steps to implementing it? How much does it cost? Where can I find out more? Sure, you should answer that question, but only if you consistently start with the larger group of people asking the more basic questions. So that's number one, customer focus, question answer based. Number two, it's consistent. Like I said, a single ebook, one blog post, one podcast episode is not content marketing. Content marketing, like a publisher, answers questions every single day, or at least it, it provides access to those answers every single day. There's consistency. In fact, I spent a lot of time writing about the magical math of frequency, that when you go from random to regular to more regular, meaning you know weekly, every other day, every day, a couple of times a day, there's an exponential increase in not just the traffic you can reach or the engagement and social shares you can get but the number of leads that you get. And it's absolutely definitive. And I don't have a single client that went from random to regular content that didn't see a 30 to 400% increase in traffic. Every single one of those saw a similar increase in the amount of leads they were getting. So as I used to say to my old boss, it's just math and it used to drive him crazy. But the math of frequency is something, I feel like it gets lost in the false choice in our industry of quality over quantity. I've never written a blog post where I've said, this one's going to suck, but I got to get it out because it's Tuesday and I need to publish a blog on Tuesday. No, yeah. I do my best on every, you know, you do your best in every podcast. You know, you stick to a consistency and you create the best thing that you can on that schedule. You know, we send trains out on a regular schedule. We put gas in them and we, you know, we hope that our passengers are safe. We don't send out a train with no gas or send out a train with no conductor. Like the quality versus quantity debate is irrelevant because no one, I think, you know, makes that choice or decides to do that because why would you? So those are a couple of the sort of big myths that I think are out there around content marketing. If I got too worked up, I'll apologize. No, no, it's, it's more passion, right? I mean, for you, <laughs> the thing it shows you're passionate about it, right? There's That's the thing about it is I think that, and you hit the nail on the head, frequency is such a big deal in regards to really be able to get your message out, right? Because everybody can do a podcast for two episodes and then say it doesn't work. And the same with influencer marketing that, you know, people say, oh, I hired some girl on Instagram and we tried the campaign. It just didn't work. So influencer marketing doesn't work. And it's like, yeah, but you just did one campaign. Like it's not, you just wrote one blog post. We haven't got any traffic to that blog post because it takes time. Like I can promise you just because you do 20 setups today doesn't mean you're going to wake up with abs. Yeah. I've tried it. I've only done it twice <laughs> and it hasn't worked. Let me just tell you. Yeah. But it really comes down to everything else. It's like frequency is such a big deal of like being consistent with stuff. Like I tell people, this is a, the analogy I always use. Like, listen, if you were like an insurance salesman, insurance sales is hard, right? I mean, you're getting, you're knocking on doors, you're calling people and people are telling you to screw off. Out of a hundred people, you get maybe one lady that thinks you're, you know, she's older and she thinks you're like her son or something. You have the conversation, but most of the people are like, we don't even want to talk to you, Right. But I'm like, if you stuck with that for five years, you could probably be a millionaire getting that residual income. You could probably make some crazy money, but you'd have to do that five years. Everybody falls off way before that. And that's why there's such a high turnover rate. But it's the same thing for everything. Like if you want to do a podcast, know that you're going to have to put in 40, 50, 60. I always ask people, what is your goal? Well, I want to make money from it. Well, then you probably shouldn't start a podcast, yeah. right? And then you probably shouldn't even write a book potentially because I can probably pretty much tell you your first book is not going to be unless you just knock it out of the park, which most people don't do. There's a lot that goes into it and you have to figure out what your goal is for that. What is your expectation? Mm -hmm. And if you were going to go and write, you know, hey, we want to do one blog post a month for two years, 
then that just shows me your, your traction that, that you want to get is going to be a lot slower. I'm okay with it. I don't think it's going to be beneficial, mm-hmm. but I always tell, you know, I, I tell clients, like I'm like, you know, give them three options and say, Hey, obviously I, you know, I think package three is the best one. And they go, well, of course it's more expensive. I go, no, it's because you're looking for traction, right? Like at the end of the day, like it's better for me because I know that the more content we write for you guys, that you guys are going to have better successes. It's just, that's just how it goes. Yeah. But as soon as you drop off and do this and do that, I'm, I'm telling people that today because of this whole, and I'm bringing up again, the coronavirus thing. I've had clients that come to me and say, hey, we're, we want to stop our budget for six months. And I go, but why though? Like unless, unless you're like living paycheck to paycheck, which I do get it, companies are there. But like you really, this is the time to move ahead. Like this is, you got to keep that frequency up. People are going to have the eyeballs, which is great. But you have to like, you want it, you don't want to become irrelevant, right? There's plenty mm-hmm. of companies that are going to stop. So for me, my company, we're doubling up a market. Like yeah. I'm the, I want to be, I'm, now's that time. Like my PPC used to be $5. Now it's $2 because mm-hmm. people aren't there. And it's the same thing with SEO. People are going to kind of, I'm not going to put as much content out. We got to kind of put everything on ice for two months. Please do. Cause I'm looking to move ahead. So mm-hmm. if you guys can all stop for a little bit. And we're going to, and once again, we're going to increase that frequency because we know that we can stick with that frequency. But I think that's yeah. what people miss. There's a quote and I keep messing the quote up, but it's something, and I don't know, I think it was like Benjamin Franklin, which I don't even know if he used the one who really said it, but it was something that he did something because it's, but it, people don't like to do it because it's disguised as work. I have to find the quote. But anyways, the point of it was like, really when it comes into putting that major effort for that frequency, you have to understand you got to keep that going and you have to tell yourself, Hey, I'm willing to do this for six months. I'm willing to do a hundred podcasts. I'm willing to do whatever that is, but that's work, right? That's the, that's the content marketing that you're talking about is it isn't just putting something up on Instagram, which another thing that you pointed out, which I thought was phenomenal. A lot of people don't really understand is like, cause I work with a lot of influencers and influencer marketing. We've got our course and all that fun stuff. And people are like, well, yeah, but you know, oh my God, Instagram, this, that, and the other. So you don't own Instagram. Yep. You put hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of hours, whatever you've done over there, just know that they can either switch a button, they can pull back the algorithm, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Nothing against Instagram, but they, not that they don't care about you, but they're going to do what's best for them, right? Yeah. And so just know that the algorithm is always going to be worse for you, that there's always, you know, it's, it's ne- so you have to look at like, I love you said things that you own, right? So you're talking about if you own your website, well, great. That's where you should be pushing everybody to because mm-hmm. you own that. Nothing's yep. as long as you pay your hosting, which is $10 a month and you pay your, you know, whatever GoDaddy, which is now used to be 10, now it's 20 bucks, whatever that is, that's yours. And you can continuously drive that traffic and build on that. And of course, it takes time and resources, but I think the frequency thing is something that people really have to understand. It's like, if you're scared of work, if you're, you're not going to put it in, everybody can do one blog post. Everybody can yeah. do two videos. Everybody can stop at that certain point. And 90% of the people will. So that's the one thing you can trust. And then the people that go through that and say, as long as you can obviously handle that financially and be able to go through that. I mean, I'll get, tell you, this is my 40 something podcast. Every time I go get on a podcast, I mean, it's just a lot of work, even though it's, mm-hmm. you know, putting this all together. And, but we're getting to a point now we're getting some crazy traction. We're doing almost 10,000 a month downloads which is awesome. awesome. And yeah, yeah, and it's killer. But in the first time I did, I was like, even my mom was like, I was going to listen, but I couldn't. So I'm like, okay, so it's just me, right? That's like, I didn't even have anybody <laughs> listening. Now That's I've got right. my mom, my aunt, and, and I probably got everybody listening because they're like, well, we're at the house and we can't go anywhere. So we have to listen to Shane's <laughs> annoying voice on the podcast, but <laughs> it is what it is. But Anyways, I think frequency, that's my big, and now I got all passionate on them. But it, you know, that, the thing is, is I just think that's important is that if you're willing to get into anything, you got to go all in. Like you want mm-hmm. the six pack, you're going to have to work out for six months and eat right. I mean, that's just yeah. how it goes. If you want to go do the podcast, you have to figure out what do I need to do to not make money off this for six months to really, yeah. really push hard and be able to look at how are we looking at the return on investment? What exactly are we going to be able to do? And now that you're offering a free PDF, this is not even going to cost you anything, folks. Like at the end of the day, go grab the PDF from Mike and let's take a look at that. So what are some of the, are there any like any good like content marketing tools? Like I know we talked about there's content marketing, right? Like, is that like, Hey, like putting yeah. together a full program. Are there yeah. any other tools or anything that you would recommend? I mean, obviously you've been doing this a long time. Yeah. I love your questions. Again, again I know I'm not sure when you're going to uh, publish this, uh, this episode, but I just wrote an article on how to market in a time of fear. So invite your audience. It's totally free. Just go check out that article. It's funny, me and you probably know Katie Martell. She was going to be at Oracle as well. And we published, she published it on LinkedIn. I published it on my blog site with almost the exact same title at the exact same, in the, well, at least within the same hour on Friday last week. So that was March 27th, I think. But basically one of the things that I talk about is find your influencers not to share tweets, but to co-create for your audience. Because right now people are looking for experts, not for you and your CEO to send out a COVID-19 email, but for you to maybe send out an email to your audience to say, hey, here's the future 
of our industry and how it's being impacted by this pandemic. Here's an expert we've reached out to one of our, you know, quote unquote influencers to share their thoughts. Like I've, I see companies doing that. I've been asked by a couple of companies to do that. And I think it's a sign that you're putting your customers first. So that's one of the things in the end of March, I also wrote a post on the content marketing I, tools I use for my own mm. business. So, uh, you know, again, and, and one of them is, is a partner. So that's Divi HQ I use for content calendaring. But the rest are I'm not affiliated with in any way. So I'll use Hootsuite for social sharing. If you get the pro account, I love to use it and I use it for clients even. We semi-automate their social sharing. So every time I publish a blog post, Hootsuite takes the RSS feed and auto shares it out to my LinkedIn business and personal accounts. Now, I don't like to automate everything and I don't really recommend anyone automate everything. But I do think it's a great way for you to take your social accounts and to have them semi-automate the sharing so that you can focus on engagement, which is what I do. I go into Twitter. I'm not really sharing articles because I have that all somewhat scheduled out. I'm there to thank people and to comment on other people's uh, posts or reply to comments I get. So Hootsuite, you can use their RSS function to auto-share. What else uh, did I talk about? I use MailChimp to auto-create my RSS newsletter every morning. So when I publish an article on Monday at 8 a.m. every Monday Eastern time, MailChimp automatically sends out a newsletter to my subscriber list. I use WordPress like 60% of us around the world. <laughs> um, what else was in that post? I use SEM Rush as well. So again, not affiliated with any of these companies except for Divi. We're sort of customers of each other. But SEM Rush is just a great way. I, every piece of content I write, every content we plan for our clients and all the content strategy analysis and research we do, we use SEO driven analytics. You can use SEM Rush, which I use. Ahrefs is another one. Moz has some great tools as well. So just you know to give some some equal time. But those are the tools that I really use on a daily basis outside of just you know regular native Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Yeah. So we use SEM Rush too. We um, have a good relationship with those guys. We you know, actually we use all the softwares as well. I mean, once again, when you talk about creating content with intent and keyword driven type stuff. You know, once you get a, a good enough domain authority and get some stuff, you can get some good rankings, you start putting some posts up, good things can happen. Yeah. So how long have you been writing for your blog? You said it's almost been what? So the first, po first post I wrote was two, May of 2009. So it'll be 11 years in, in two months. And uh, um, I think I'm up to 900 some uh, published posts. I started at once a week. I moved up to now I do two a week. Sometimes last week I did three because I wanted to write the how do you market in a time of fear because it was sort of on my mind. And even in that post, I talk about how, you know, for me, I've been kind of business as usual because I have the schedule. I'm sticking to the schedule. I'm not trying to be opportunistic in this time of fear. I think it's awful for brands that are. I think advertising campaigns should really be looked at unless they're really totally related. So for me, it's therapy in a way. I mean, I listen to the questions I get from my audience. I try to answer them as best I can in, in one or two articles a week. And I just wrote another post last Monday about how we generated nearly a million visitors in the last year just by following this simple strategy of consistently answering customer questions in your content. Which is crazy to me to think because it's like, I talk, you know Marcus Sheridan? Of course. Mar Marcus yeah. is, he's my, you asked the answer was the probably him and Joe Polizzi and Hanley, these folks we both know, definitely influenced a lot, a lot of my success at SAP to start as well as the way that I act and work as a consultant. Well, it's funny. It's just, you talk about the, and it's what's so basic in nature of like, if you're, if you're if, a, there's the search volume that you can look at. If people are asking certain questions, you kind of touch out with the SAP thing of like, what the, what the heck is cloud computing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, but then there's the other side of it is if your customers are asking you certain questions and if you're not answering those in a public form, like if you have, you talk to your customer service guy and he says, Hey, we get these same 10 questions, uh, 20 different guys have been asked the same. 10 questions like write a blog post about that like right and there's probably gonna be search volume around that as well like it's very simplistic and there's you don't need to go and go look at core to go find this like literally I mean you can use it as a resource but like you have that internally like you can go ask those specific questions and write that content to ask to what's gonna be able to put that content up hopefully if it indexes for number one then you're driving that traffic so you guys hit over a million last year or is it for the last just under just under in the last 12 months and I mean you know, short of the, the, you know, the pandemic impact, which ha we have seen a decrease in, in traffic. I, I was doing some Google trend research and saw that in a lot of B2B search terms, marketing, content, website development. I mean, if you look at some of the stuff that businesses might be thinking about cloud computing, the search volume is down about, it's off about 35 basis points from their highs because you can only see an index in, in Google trends. I have a couple of clients who are actually seeing 10, 20% increases in their traffic because they are writing 
about how their industry is being impacted or things their customers should be thinking about because of the current crisis. But yeah, so we were up until the recent pandemic, we've been trending at about 100,000 visitors per month. So we would have gotten to, I think, a million, you know, in a rolling 12 months period pretty quickly. Damn you, coronavirus. So close. That's right. You guys will get it. You guys will get it. It's fun. Um, it's fun. I have clients that I have more, you know, I'm a company of, of two and I have clients that are, have tens of thousands of employees worth a billion dollars on the stock market and they don't get a million visitors a year. It's crazy. Don't you love um, that? You're like, you that's, have some room. You have big budgets. I, 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 always, I, I always love to say you can talk to the one person who's ready to buy today or you can talk to that person and the hundred times more people that are ready to buy maybe tomorrow or the day after that. Why would you just talk to that one person? You, that's what your sales team is for. It's amazing how many companies take that our website is our sales brochure approach and they just miss out on an ability to build trust, to build conversations, to build the audience of people they can nurture. Yeah, makes total sense. So tell us about your speaking career. How long have you been speaking for? So, you know, it was kind of organic. I actually sort of went through pretty, I worked my way through some pretty intense stage fright and found some techniques to kind of forget that it's not about you and your anxiety and, and really it's all about the audience is, is really kind of the trick that helped, you know, kind of turn a corner for me. But when I was at SAP, I started getting asked to do webinars. Some of those webinars you know, did well enough that people asked me to come speak at their events. I think like with writing, I always tell people, no one is a great writer when they write their first blog article, but by the time they do 100, they're pretty good. And my first speech was probably awful. I think, you know, at some point I, I felt pretty confident about it. The height of my speaking career was probably about two years ago. And my health started to suffer. I was missing my family, making great money. But, you know, I felt like for, as a speaker, you kind of have to chase every gig, as you know. Yeah. And so about a year and a half ago, I decided to really focus on sort of a monthly regular recurring revenue stream, focusing on client delivery, content delivery, strategy work, and really just sort of not actively pursuing speaking engagements. It turned out to be, you know, and, and I hate, I, I feel so bad for all of, you know, my friends out there that are relying on their speaking income. But I got lucky. My last couple, I had two gigs in May. I had none for April. The ones in May were canceled, but they were pretty small dollar numbers. I've got a couple in the, in the fall period, but again, also not at the height of the dollar amounts I was making. So I'm available to speak. I'm happy to do it. There are events I want to be at anyway. And if, if I get paid to speak or paid to be there, that's, that's great. But just me personally, I'm trying to focus on, you know, I've got four kids, 16 through eight, and they're just getting in that phase where, you know, when they were active, we're obviously not doing anything now, but, you know, typically driving all over the place with practices and, and, and you know, after school events. So happy to be home, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad thing. I, you know, we look at this whole thing and I think it's a, it's a recalibration of the world. I look at that as like, this is, a lot of things have changed, a lot of things have happened. I look at it like, you know what, I think this has happened for a reason. Not that I want people to die and there's a reason behind that. You know, there's got to be something, but I just, I do feel like this is kind of that time where it's one of those things. I think that when people can start spending more time with their family and start like less worrying about some of the other stuff. So I don't know. I'm, I, like I said, I'm a very optimistic person when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I, I do think some good things will happen from it. And so I'm excited to see how that goes. And I will, I will share your anxiety from speaking that's real. Like that stuff is like, I mean, I've talked about this in past podcasts. Like, you know, I will, you know, five minutes before I'm going on and this is, I'm better now, but you know, when I first was going on, I would just was like, why am I doing this? Maybe I should just leave. Maybe I should, you know, I know they flew me out here. I can act like I was sick. No, that's not a good idea. Okay. That's not good. What do we need to do? And then five minutes later I'm on stage and you know, for the most part, things were going fine. But the anxiety behind that is like, that's just, I mean, that's, you know, people we've talked about this in passive, like, you know, it's that people are more fearful of speaking than they are dying, which there was a point where I thought maybe if I died before I went on stage, maybe that, that would justify it. Right? There's yeah. nobody could say anything, yeah. but then it kind of, your career stops and you don't get to see your family. And there's a lot of downsides to that. So I'm not recommending dying before you go on stage. It's just not recommended at all. It's just not a no. good career move. But so cool. We're getting down to the end of this thing. Like, this is what happens when you have a good time, but when you're all- Time flies. Up, I, yeah, this I is want, fun. I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to bring it up. But what yeah. other, pro you got any other fun projects you're working on? I know there's probably some of them halted. We got anything. I know you talked about maybe you kind of- I mean, the, the audience a little, maybe potentially a book. What do we got? Yeah, so, so this is the latest one, Mean People Suck. And it was, you know, kind of a passion project. Again, talking to the cultural aspect, I write a book. I started with sort of like advertising is dead because I just feel like there's just so much data behind uh, pounding promotion and product in front of people is not the best way to sell stuff. But I really started getting to why do people do advertising? Why do people think marketing is just advertising? 
And again, it's not to say advertising doesn't have its place, but I love to joke, if you ask your mom what marketing is, she'll say ads. If you ask CFO what marketing is, he'll say it's the ad budget. I, you know, it's the TVs, the stuff we're spending money on. They don't realize that it's supposed to be a conversation. So I started with marketing, but it really became a cultural sort of leadership book and, and really trying to address the fact that we don't put customers at the center of our organization. I think marketing can really lead customer experience transformations across the companies. You know, the book, it, it's, it's actually doing better, trending better than the content formula did. I have merch. So if anybody in your audience wants to buy the book on Amazon, I'll send them, a, just send me a note. I'll send you a t-shirt. Um, I've got some pretty cool t-shirts and merch uh, that I did for it. I did one speech to an HR publisher that most people would have heard of. And just the payment for that speaking fee alone paid for all the cost to write the book. So I'm already at, you know, return on investment. Every dollar I make yeah. at this point is bringing a return. I'm not an organization design consultant. I'm not looking to get into leadership development necessarily, but marketing transformation is certainly something on the minds of CMOs. I do, like I said, believe that marketing can lead that transformation. So we'll see. Look at this all gravy after this point, huh? That's good. That's right. I gotta, hey, got to get going. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. You guys and I, and I will, I will admit that mean people do suck. I don't care where you at, but if you're a mean person, especially in this current age, if you're mean, try to not be mean. That's just my recommendation. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know how you would not try to be mean, but just look in the mirror and be like, that was something mean that you were about to do. It's, don't do it. I have to give Ann Hanley credit for this. If you're a marketer and you're doing anything right now, if you have empathy for your customers or you put, as Ann would say, make your customer the hero of the story, you wouldn't be doing so much of the marketing that we're doing, especially in these times that we're all facing. I saw an ad for Chevy trucks last night. The dealerships are closed. I have friends who work at the Chevy dealership by my house and they're really struggling. They're fearful. And you're running ads for trucks. Like, what are you doing, Chevy? You know, like those are the things you're not, that, that's your truck is the hero of your story. Your customer should be the heroes. And so think of your marketing. That's what not sucking means is put your customers, put your employees ahead of your business and your own fears. And, and, you know, I think the world would be a better place. So I'm going to, I'm going to trump you on this one. I actually saw a Corona commercial two nights ago for beer. I was like, uh Oh no, I'm just kidding. That's terrible. That's terrible. But I did see it. And I was thinking, boy, they, can they not stop that, that programming that they got them? I probably not a good idea. Great, yeah. I'm like, I don't know if a lot of people are buying your beers right now. Not, not that the coronavirus has anything to do with the beers, but people, you know, make that, that anyways, they, they put the two together. Mm. So cool. So we're at the end of this thing. Once again, I know this is going to be difficult for both of us to, to not talk every day now. Cause I know we've yeah. kind of got that, that we've got that, that, that power now, the things that definitely between us. Yeah, but, <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. You sound like my wife. Yeah. Sounds good. This guy. He's awesome. oh my God, my. But give us three. So I want, I want you to do, and I just put up the, the number two and it's actually three on the podcast here, but give us three people that either dead or alive that you would want to have dinner with. Cause I always like to hear like some people are musicians. Some people are like, Oh, one guy said, I want to have dinner with Jesus, which is, that's your thing. Hey, awesome. Okay. Have, you know, eat with Jesus. Yes. And I said, that's like be a powerful conversation. I'm sure. Sure. Anybody? Is there like three people that you're like, and it could be a past relative. I just, I'm yeah. always intrigued to see who's at people at the table. Yeah, sure. Definitely. So my dad passed away 10 years ago. He was diagnosed with lung cancer almost exactly 10 years ago and, and passed away in just a few months. It was crazy how fast it went. So certainly him, I miss him every day. Strangely enough, during this pandemic, I've been dreaming about him almost every night. So I, I guess I'm looking back for some comfort maybe, He's but, there, but yeah. he was my best friend in my adult life and really lucky to have that relationship. I mentioned Joseph Campbell. So I, like I said, I'm sort of a, a story nerd. Joseph Campbell's uh, probably one of the smartest and one of the first people. The, the insight that I loved that I remember learning about him, and I learned this even after actually graduating with an English lit degree, was he studied every foundational stories of cultures all around the world and found that they had a common thread. They had a common flow. And, and it's, it's the hero's journey that he basically reverse engineered. But the fact that it, it shows that even Aborigines that grew up with it, without any contact with the outside world, they tell stories the same way that we do. We're, we're connected. We're all the same. And mm. so I love that sort of aspect of, of what he did. And then I just, you know, you got to bring in a political figure. figure and I was, I think Martin Luther King, I always say like he was a, a warrior that could have grabbed a gun or a knife and instead used his intelligence and used his abilities to bring people together with hope and optimism and peace in a way that I wouldn't have, you know, I, if I were him growing up in the time he did, I would have been pretty angry. So yeah. <laughs> I, I give him a lot of credit for just not being 
an angry physical, but instead just, you know, use spirituality and, and his intelligence to really inspire millions of people and create what ultimately became, I think, at least a step towards or a march towards, you know, sort of more equality. Yeah, for sure. I love it. I love it. Like the table, like the table a lot. Sounds like it'll be good. And I would be fun. Maybe I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So <laughs> Michael, if anybody needs to get in contact with you, once again, it's been awesome having you on the podcast, but if anyone wants to reach out to you, I know you talked about LinkedIn, where can they get in contact with you with the website? Give us some details. Yeah, sure. Marketinginsidergroup.com is where you can find my content on marketing and all things content. Um, meanpeoplesuck.com, you can buy t-shirts or, or books there. But LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach out and just, you know, send a connection request and include a personal note or just once I, you know, hopefully connect. Um, I try to connect with everyone that doesn't look like a spam account. Just send me a note and say, hey, I, I you know, heard you on the podcast and, um, you know, can you send me over a free PDF? I'd be happy to do that. So I have a question for you. Meanpeoplesuck.com. Did you have to buy that domain? Was that available? It was for, for a really small amount. Can you believe it? I, when I, when really? I heard, you know, and, and I have to be honest, my wife and I know we're out over time, but my wife and I actually secretly thought we might become billionaires in a fashion brand utilizing the Mean People Suck domain and creating t-shirts. It's, I've only might. sold two. I've sold two. So I've given up on the thought that we may become uh, fashion, mean, fashion millionaires or billionaires. But uh, yeah, who, who knew that that domain would be available? Mean people's, I would think that somebody would have been writing a blog about that or something like to me, that's what I thought for sure would have been somebody was either sitting on it or sold it for a lot of money. So you got to no, mean people suck dot com. Okay. Really, really, really affordable. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm write, writing one a week on sort of cultural leadership. There's a, uh, some marketing in it, but really mostly it's just about how companies need to change and focus on customers and employees. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Michael, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And you guys, if you're listening to this podcast, you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to it. And as I bring up every week, I do have my course that's coming out. My howtobeaninfluencer.com is the, uh, the website. Go take a look at that. Once again, it's less about being an influencer and having like, you know, a Ferrari and, you know, pink poodle and eating caviar on the weekends and doing yoga on Tuesdays. It's more about like how to be an entrepreneur and how to really put your campaign together. If you really want to be an influencer, how to talk to brands, how to pitch brands, how to work with brands, how to negotiate with brands and all the other fun stuff. So you guys, once again, go check that out, howtobeaninfluencer.com. And Michael, thank you once again so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It was fun. 